Last Sunday, a member of our church family said to me after worship service, Pastor, could you preach a sermon about how to evangelize atheists? I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. And as I scoured the scriptures once again, I realized that this is quite a task because this is more of a topical sermon than it is just zeroing in on one passage because you can't just find one passage that deals with how to evangelize, that is, how to share the gospel, how to witness to someone who is an atheist. So what I've done is I've pulled together a theme and these four scriptures there's probably others, but these are the four I've chosen. And I start with the one from the Psalms, Psalm 14.1, which says, The fool says in his heart there is no God. And that's all you're going to find in Scripture about atheism. There isn't anything more. It's one brief, like a meteor in the night. It's there, it's gone. The fool says there is no God there's no commentary. There's nothing more than that. We don't find a story in Scripture about a conversation between a believer and an atheist. We don't have anything to go on. Why? Because in the ancient world, people mostly, there are a couple exceptions here and there, but mostly people in the ancient world either believed in one god, or they believed in many gods and goddesses. It was a rare bird to find somebody who said, I don't believe that there is a god at all. That's more of a modern phenomenon that goes back a few hundred years up to our time. Oh, sure, there were a few atheists, but they were few and far between. Most people were theists. They believe in some type of God. They worship someone or something. Even anthropologists who study human nature will tell us as they study human cultures of today and of ancient times, there's not one culture in the world, modern or what we call primitive, that is atheistic. They all worship someone that they call God or gods, goddesses. They don't go through life not worshiping. So this phenomenon about atheism is relatively new in human history. But scripture still tells us it's foolish to say there is no God because God does exist. Thing is, though, it does not exist for the atheist. So where do you go with that? I've encountered atheists in my Christian life. Perhaps you have too. Maybe you have atheists among your friends, your friends at school, your friends at work, maybe even family members who are atheists. And how do you start the conversation? It's easier to start if somebody has some belief in God. But if the atheist is starting with the premise there is no God, and you believe that there is a God, where do you begin? Well, first of all, don't say to the atheist you're a fool because the Bible says you are one. The Bible says the fool says there is no God. That's the end of the discussion right there. You know that. I know that. That's something you don't need to bring into the discussion. So we move to the passage from Romans 1, where the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says that God, the one true God, reveals himself in many ways, and one of those ways is through nature, through creation. He says you just have to look around you and see that there's all this order, and all this symmetry, and all this beauty, and all this harmony in the universe, on planet Earth, and in the human body itself. But the atheists I've spoken to 
when I say that, I said, don't you see God's hand in creation? And they'll say, well, you're arguing for order in nature, but I see a lot of chaos. What I see is not just the order, the sun rises and sets and we have the seasons. What I see, the atheist tells me, is the dysfunction and the chaos, such as natural disasters, plagues, famine, drought, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, diseases. And they've told me, how can you say that there is a God who would allow all of this if nature is so beautiful and wonderful and created so nicely? And they have a point. They do. And I'm tempted in my discussions with atheists to go philosophically with them. But I'm not a philosopher. Yes, I took philosophy courses in college. And yes, they were boring. But yes, I passed. <laughs> okay? And I know the classic arguments for the existence of God in philosophy. I know those. But there are people who can punch holes in my philosophical arguments. Left, right, and center. And that won't work. Not for me. There are philosophers who are better at it than I am. And I also realize as a Christian that the Bible is not a book of philosophy. It's a book of theology. It's a book that reveals God. God's nature and God's will. If you reduce it to a philosophy book and try to argue someone into faith in God that way, you're going to find someone who's smarter at it than you are philosophically. And you'll be left with egg on your face going, oh, there goes my argument. But the fact is that God is revealed in creation. How do you explain the dysfunction of nature? How do you explain the chaos and all the, quote, natural disasters? I can't. To an atheist, I would say, I'm not going to discount the existence of God just because I see all this madness in nature. But I can't really explain it. Moving on to the 2 Timothy 3 passage. Once again, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, gives a prophecy. He says, in the last times, people will become like this. And he has this laundry list of things going from bad to worse. It's just a horrible description of human nature. And you see the last thing, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Doesn't say more than lovers of God, but rather. This takes the place. Instead of loving God, instead of acknowledging God, God's thrown out, and instead, we have the pursuit of pleasure. What's in it for me? I want to live life for me. And we're living in the last days, when atheism is getting more and more prevalent in our world. We have atheistic professors and writers Go to the bookstores, and not just the Christian bookstores. Go to any bookstore, and you will find books on the bestseller list written by famous atheists of our day who are arguing against the existence of God. And when I read those things, I say, well, logically it makes sense, but I'm not going on pure logic as a Christian. I'm going on something called faith, which my atheist friend thinks is Foolish. How can you believe in someone you don't even see? And how can you trust a book, the Bible, which they feel is full of myths and legends and contradictions? They say, you're just so gullible. You're just hanging on to this belief in God 
because you don't have the guts to join me in saying there is no God. My father grew up in the church, but he left the church as a young man. And he often would joke with me, even though he always admired my faith. He said to me, you know the slogan of the atheist, son, it's, I am an atheist, thank God. <laughs> and then he said, you know the difference between an agnostic and an atheist, son? I said, no. He said, an agnostic is an atheist without guts. <laughs> As you know, the atheist says, there is no God. The agnostic says, I'm not sure there is a God. So the agnostic, according to my dad, has no guts to say there is no God. End of discussion. So how could my dad, who grew up in the church, leave the church, leave faith, leave God behind? I asked him one day, I said, you went to church every Sunday as a boy and as a teenager. Why did you suddenly throw God out of your life? We well, had several reasons, but the big reason was, son, I cannot look at the evil and the suffering in this world and believe that there is a God who would allow it. And when I talk to my atheistic friends and relatives, that's the number one argument they throw in my face. How can you believe in God or any God when there's so much suffering and evil in this world? Why would God, who is supposed to be love, allow all of this? I don't have a good answer for that. Once again, my atheist friends can poke holes in all my arguments. But I go by faith knowing that sometimes bad things happen to good people, okay? But why blame God? If the atheist really believes there is no God, why take the time, why invest the time to argue against God since God doesn't exist anyway? Why write a book about God doesn't exist if God doesn't exist? It makes no sense to me, but it does to the atheist who feels that all of us Christians and anybody else of any faith group in the world are a bunch of idiots. I don't know about your conversations with atheists, whether at school or at work or in your neighborhood or within your family. And as I mentioned, one of the big arguments against believing in God is how can there be a loving God or any God and allow evil and suffering? You have to address that. You can't just sort of dance around it and avoid it. Because people go through things that are tough. Atheists go through tough times in life. Christians go through tough times in life. As a Christian, I ask my atheist friend, when the bottom falls out in your life, and when you're facing tragedy, where's your strength? How do you cope? The answer I get is, it's my inner strength. I said, well, good for you. But I tell them, my inner strength will only take me so far. It's like taking a long walk off a short pier, and eventually I'm going to splash into the water. I said, when tragedy strikes me as a Christian, then I have to cling to God even if I don't have the answers as why. At least I know God is there and he cares. The reply I get, the response I get is usually a smirk. 
uh, sort of a smile like, oh, poor, poor delusional Victor. <laughs> Hanging on to a God who doesn't exist because it brings him some sense of comfort when things go wrong. But that's what it is for me. Is that what it is for you? When bad things happen to you, are you able to hold on to God and your faith in God even though the bottom drops out in your life? When all is said and done, you really can't argue an atheist into faith in God. You will lose the argument. I tried. Believe me, I tried over and over again. I tried with logic. I tried with scripture. I raised my voice. I got upset. It didn't work. It never will work. But the one thing I found that at least might get my foot in the door to make them reconsider their position that there is no God is what the Apostle Peter, Peter advises us in his first letter. When he says, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that you have. In other words, make it personal. If you try to argue the atheist into faith or give them facts and figures, etc., usually the atheist will counter with other facts and figures, which usually will destroy your argument. But what I found is, if I say, can I tell you a story? Usually they'll say, okay, go ahead. And then I tell that atheist about my faith experience. Why I believe in God, and especially why I believe in God when times get tough in my life. Now it's personal. Now I'm not telling them, you have to believe what I believe, but this is what I believe. This is the one I believe in. Because if I didn't, I would fall apart. Emotionally, spiritually, in every way. And every time I've asked permission of that atheist to listen to my story, I've always gotten a go-ahead. Now, I don't have any silver lining story to tell you this morning that at least one of those Times, one of those conversations, one of those atheists I've talked to in years past came to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior because of my testimony. Maybe they did, but they never told me. <laughs> but at least they listened to my story and said, well, I'm glad it works for you, Victor. But don't expect me to believe it. But they always said, that's a nice story. And I'm glad God works for you. And I always ended with, well, he will work for you too. If you let him. If you'll give him a try. He's as close as your own heart. You see, it's something called the personal story that touches the human heart. We're all story people. We all like a good story. And especially, not one, I've heard about this person who da 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 da, but this is what happened to me. And I like to listen up a little more closely. Yeah, tell me what happened in your life. And it gets me thinking on a different level. It gets me feeling on a different level. And it will do the same for that atheist friend or relative you have who hears your story of why you believe in God, especially why you believe in the God who came to earth known as Jesus.
of Nazareth. There's no guarantee that that atheist will come to faith. But there's a better chance that he or she will if you tell your story than if you don't. And say, you know what? This person's a lost cause. This person's a tough nut to crack. I can't do anything with this atheist. And sometimes the atheist will have, like my father, grown up in church and then abandoned church. And some never went to church, never had any religion whatsoever growing up in their house. But they still have this very strong atheism. So I want to leave you with those four passages of scripture to use as tools, practical tools. Who says the Bible is not practical? For goodness sake, yes it is. If it isn't practical, then why in the world do we read it? Why in the world do I preach it? All scripture is inspired by God and useful. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, useful, it's practical, it works. So don't give up on your atheist friends and relatives, schoolmates, and co-workers. Please. You may be the one that will get them to thinking and feeling on a deeper level than they ever did because you share your story. Don't argue them into the kingdom. Love them into it. Speak the truth in love. And let your testimony and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. And then remember that when you're not with them especially, pray, pray, pray that there will be a change from unbelief to belief. As I've quoted many times as a benediction in this church, I'll say it again and then we're going to sing it. But not just those words, but the whole hymn this morning as our closing one. Share his love by telling what the Lord has done for you. Share his love by sharing of your faith. That's what Peter is trying to tell us. Share two things with the atheist. Share his story, that is, the gospel, the good news of Jesus and his salvation. And share your story, that is, your personal testimony of how God, through Jesus his son, is real to you. And then let God, through his story, and your story, soften their hearts, open their hearts, change their hearts. From unbelief to belief, from atheism to faith in Jesus. Share his love. Let's sing it together.